Today is March 6th, Monday, uh, 2017, and my name is Lester Sharlock, and I have the honor and the privilege today to interview my cousin, Zelda Zieselman, at the Atria in Stanford, and we're doing this for the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. Good afternoon, Zelda. Hello, Lester. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you and to be interviewed for this wonderful organization. And I'm glad I'm able to do this with, with all of you lovely people. Uh, you asked me a question, yes. What is your full name? Oh, I'm Zelda Miller Zieselman um, from Stanford, Connecticut, born and raised here at Stanford Hospital. And who and was the old, doctor that delivered? Dr. Jacob Nemoyton, who <laughs> only the old timers know, and he delivered a lot of people. He also used to make house calls and bring lollipops and end up having, he'd take a look at us for two seconds and then sit down and have a cup of tea with my mother and talk about the whole town. <laughs> and yeah, Dr. Jacob Nemoyton and the old Stanford Hospital and what was a brick building and I think the maternity was on the fifth floor because my mother said I was born in the elevator. As the door opened up, there I came. And was she surprised. And it was a pleasure to be here. Of course, I didn't know it at the time. I had to wait a few years. And then I realized I was born in Stanford Hospital. So. Tell me about your parents. Who, who were they and where they? My mother was a Gratsky. She was born in Warsaw, Poland, and she moved, moved here. She sailed here at three years old. Uh, my grandfather, who was a cantor in Warsaw, Poland, an ordained cantor, uh, came to this country first, and he had to be established with a business. So he went into the copper business, and he was one of the men who put the copper domes on the mosques in New York. And uh, after a year of saving money, he sent for my uh, mother and his wife, of course, my grandmother, and one other child who was born in Poland. The only problem was they came on a ship after sailing, I think it was three weeks, and he heard that a three-year-old child died on the ship of scarlet fever, and he thought it was his daughter. So he's on the pier, and he hears this, and he went into hysterics crying. And when my mother came off the ship, she was two years old when he left. But now she's three, but he recognized her. He saw her. He couldn't believe that she was still alive, and he hugged her so my mother said he almost broke her ribs. She escaped from Poland in a hay wagon, in a false bottom, because the Cossacks would come with pitchforks, into the hay wagons, and they would stick their pitchforks into the wagon, and if anybody was in there, it's, it's Achim Bay. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, thank God they were hidden, small enough to hide in a box, and then she went on a ship, and she came to this country, and that started the whole family on my mother's side. Her maiden name was Grafsky, but at Ellis Island, they changed the name from Grabinski to Grafsky which happened to a lot of people who came here in those days from other parts of Europe to escape tyranny. Yeah. What was the name of your grandpa's business in Stanford? My grandfather, I don't know the name of it. All I know is he became a coppersmith, and he used to supply copper piping pipes to my husband's grandfather's buildings on Henry Street. My grandfather was a builder, and my grandfather, my husband's grandfather, his name was Mr. Weisberg, and he was a builder, and my grandfather uh, was a coppersmith. So he delivered copper pipes to his buildings on Henry Street, and they ended up suing each other. And the reason being, <laughs> one day they delivered the pipes, and the cart with the pipes on it got loose. My grandfather went into the building to tell my husband's grandfather, who wasn't my husband then, I was a little girl. I don't know if I, 
I wasn't even born yet. Anyway, uh, and there was a damage to the house. So my grandfather sued my husband's grandfather, and my husband's grandfather sued my grandfather. And they went to court, and the judge awarded each of them a dollar. Because they can't prove whose fault it was, who, who, brought, who left the brake off the car. And that's the story about it. And there was no name of his business. And my grandmother, they were in, actually, they rented out the tenement houses on Henry Street. And that was their income. And my mother, grandmother used to sit at the table and she would count out the money uh, in, with envelopes. And she would say in Yiddish, a tula here, a tula there. This is for the milkman, this is for the ice man, this is for this man. And that's how they paid the bills in cash in those days. And uh, from the rent. And they didn't trust the banks, so there was money hidden all over her house. In here, in the purse, in the, in the fireplace, I don't know where, <laughs> uh, above door sills. She hid the money because they wouldn't go to a bank. And that's pretty much the story. Well, it's interesting because in our research, we found that the first meetings of Jewish men for prayer service was in an apartment, Correct. a tenement on Henry Street. That's right. And yeah. my grandfather was part of that. Yeah. And so was my husband's grandfather. And they're, they were called the founders of the Luther Shalom Synagogue. And they used to meet in an apartment on Henry Street. And the first synagogue, which was on Gray Rock Place, had a fire and burnt down. And they had to rebuild it. And then, later on years, when I was grown up, we had a building fund for the new synagogue on Strawberry Hill, which Rabbi Aaron Krantz was the rabbi. May he rest in peace. Anyway, he married my husband and I. But that's another story. Yeah, what, what about your dad's parents? Okay, my father's folks, my grandmother was um, Jane Sherlock Miller. And she was related to a Sherlock from Stanford who owned store on Pacific Street. And God bless Pacific Street. I grew up there. My aunt and uncle owned Max Meyer's Delicatessen on one side of the street next to Carp's Bakery and the Atlantic Fish Market. And on the corner was Rimland Shoes. Down the other end of the street was Charlotte's Furniture Store. And every time my grandmother would come to visit us in Stanford, she would go visit her brother, Uncle Dave. I was my uncle, her brother, Emma. I used to go down and visit, and I remember vaguely, and Lester can correct me, if there was a, a stone, a, like a, a fire uh, pit, not a pit, a stove in the middle of the store that they kept warm. Do you remember that, Lester? At all? That was a pot dolly stove. A pot dolly stove, and yeah. And there was always <laughs> a uh, pot of boiling water, water. With, with fish glue in it. <laughs> Because my grandfather was always repairing furniture because they sold new and used and furniture. And used furniture, correct. Yeah. So. But I remember his grandmother used to tell a story, and every other word was zuxa. I still don't know what zuxa means, probably end. But she would tell a story, and they'd all wear sweaters. Mm -hmm. She always wore this gray sweater. And Uncle Davis was yelling in the back for something I don't know. But my grandmother and and Dave's wife, uh, Esther, Esther, yeah, Esther, Esther, would talk like they knew each other for the, oh, their whole lives. They became such good friends. And one day, my grandmother said, Zelda, go up the street on Pacific Street and buy me the forward. I don't know what it was, forward, backward. She gave me a nickel or a dime, I don't recall. So I go up the street. And I see people all busy, busy, and I said to them, I must have been about five years old. And I took them, I went into this little store right across the street from the Atlantic Fish Market. It was like a candy cigar smoking store. It was Axel Rods, wasn't it? Axel Rods, see that? Thank God he's here. <laughs> what would I do without you, Lester? And I went in and I got the forward. Well, it's all in Hebrew. Well, I didn't want people to think I was ignorant. So I picked up the paper, 
and I would walk down the street and imitate the way my grandmother used to read the forward. But the 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 but like I pretended I knew what I was saying. And that young age already, I was an actress. <laughs> and I used to bring her the paper, and she'd thank you. And but that was that was fun. Pacific Street, the aromas from that. Well, I wish they never took it away. Anyway, yeah. So now that we know about your family, uh, tell us uh, where did you go to school? I started, I never went to preschool, we didn't have preschool in those days, went directly to kindergarten, was not <laughs> familiar with school. I was a free spirit. So the first day of kindergarten, I already had the dunce cap on. <laughs> my teacher had my mother as a kindergarten teacher also. Anyway, I went to Franklin School on Franklin Street, and that's where I went to sixth grade from there. I went to Burdick Junior High, which now they call middle school, and then from there I went to Stanford High, good old SHS, and I still remember the song, which I'm not going to say. And what year did you graduate? 1952. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, tell us uh, where you lived, and did you uh, celebrate the Jewish holidays? Oh, yes. Yeah. We had, well... All in those days, family lived near each other. So my Tante Rosie, who owned the Delicatessen, and my Aunt Molly, my mother's sister, who lived down the street, and then there was Gussie Robbins from Bloomfield's Delicatessen. Everybody lived in the same Lindale Street neighborhood. So on the holidays, we'd go from one house to the other, and we'd eat, and we'd eat, and we'd eat. And when we went to my grandmother's house on Lindale Street, she had this horrible horsehair chair, and it always irritated the backs of my legs. So I took my napkin, which was a linen napkin for Passover, pardon me, and I put it on the seat. And so I sat down, I wouldn't get all chafed. And don't you think my grandmother hollered at me for sitting on her napkin? So I couldn't do that anymore. I didn't want to go there, but I didn't want to go back to my grandma's house. I couldn't sit on her seat, so I ate in the kitchen. I had a good time. <laughs> I made the best of the situation. Did you keep a kosher home? Oh, interestingly enough, no. My mother came from a kosher home, but my father from England, and our whole family was from England, um, yeah, uh, he didn't keep kosher, so he didn't want my mother to keep kosher. Okay, so I didn't learn to keep kosher until I got married. And then I, my I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, it was soon after high school anyway, when I met my husband. I knew him. Ah, that's another story. Um, uh, I, so he, his, one night he said, are you going to keep kosher? And foolishly and innocently, I said, what's that? And he says, that means you keep a kosher home. I said, I don't know how. I wasn't brought up kosher. My mother didn't keep kosher. So he said, Okay, then I had a shower, and God bless my mother-in-law, Gussie Zieselman, who was a Weisberg, and a wonderful, wonderful mother-in-law. She took me, she had two sons, I became her daughter. So at my first shower, I got a pair of candlesticks. I says, well, I could at least light the candles on Friday night. One thing led to another. Every shower, I got an extra set of dishes, I got extra time. I said, what am I going to do with all of this silverware and dishes? And, well, you'll keep kosher. I said, I guess I'm going to keep kosher. And I did keep kosher for 27 years. And Zeke's grandfather, Jake Weisberg, made me a salt spreadle. A salt spreadle is a board with only two legs that you put next to the sink and you kosher your own meat. And you soak it in salt. You salt it first and all the blood drips down into the sink. And then after an hour of salt, you salt the kosher salt. And then you soaked it for an hour, and that kosher's the meat, so it's nice and clean. So I learned how to kosher. I learned how to kosher. My mother-in-law was thrilled. And then one day, my children came in with pizza, with pepperoni. And what are you doing with pizza in the house? Well, we wanted it. I said, it's not kosher. So they ate it in the den, and I said to myself, who am I keeping kosher for? My mother-in-law, my children, my husband. I don't know anymore because this is what they want. 
So I had, after 27 years, I stopped keeping kosher. And my mother-in-law didn't know it for six months because I was a coward. And I didn't want to tell her because I knew it would hurt her feelings. And it did. So I said, Mom, bring your own, can you come to the house, paper plates, bring your own food, we'll all be together. That's what's important. Then she did, and we were all happy again. Getting back to your education, did you go to a hater? We didn't have hater in those days. We only had, no, only the, we had Sunday school, but I never went to any. My brother did. He was bar mitzvah, my brother Marty. He was the oldest. We had five children in our family. What were their names? Martin was the eldest, and then Lenore, and uh, they both passed. Then I was the youngest for 10 years. And then when we moved to Morgan Street, which is right around the corner from Atria, 42 Morgan Street, my mother decided to have another child. And 14 months later, she had another child. So I became, no, I became the middle child from the youngest. And Lenore, my sister Lenore, loved babies so much and she took good care of them that she ended up becoming a nurse at Stanford Hospital. And uh, my brother was an engineer and he was uh, in the Navy and then he was attached to the Green Berets and he was in Saigon. Lenore passed away when she was 44. And uh, she had three wonderful children. They went to bicultural day school at the uh, attached to Guta Shalom. So uh, that was nice. And she lived right near the high school. So on Saturday, my children would walk over to her house and go to the football games at Stanford High School mm -hmm. so they wouldn't have to drive on Saturday. Tell us uh, about your parents. How did they earn a living? My parents, oh. <laughs> My parents owned a cleaning store called Miller's Cleaners and Dyers. The first one was on Bedford Street, and there was a flood. And I remember a photograph by Mr. Yellen, Arnold Yellen, not Arnold, Herb, yeah. Herb Yellen, Herb Yellen was Arnold's father. Yeah. <clears throat> they were our neighbors in Woodside Village, where I grew up partially. Anyway. And uh, I remember my mother was sweeping the water out of the store from the flood in 19... 39, 1940, yeah, 38. 38 was it? Yeah, I was four years old. So you remember that. Yeah, and uh, they all know. So then they moved the store to Atlantic Street across from the Palace Theater. Then they moved to Pacific Prospect Street and then over on uh, yeah, Atlantic across from the Plaza Theater. There was near a theater. <laughs> and then um, Mr. Mr. Tambori bought the business in the 50s after... I think I graduated high school. Yeah. So they were cleaning. Oh, and I started working when I was four years old. My job, very interesting, very quickly. I, my father was a genius. He tied a string around my waist, and at the end of the string, long string, was a big magnet this big. You too? Ha, 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 ha. And I had to walk up and down the floor. <laughs> in the store every few days, and the magnet would pick up the straight pins, and then I'd have to sit with the box that they came in and separate the dust balls from the straight pins and put the straight pins back in the box and throw away the dust balls, of course. <laughs> and then the next job I had, as I got older, I um, used to clean the cuffs from the pants. And, <laughs> you know, the cuffs in those days were tacked, and I'd open it up and put it by a, a, a rotating brush, and all the dirt would blow in my face. <laughs> and I'd have to go like this as I'm cleaning the the, um, the cuffs from the car. And then my father taught me how to, <gasps> how to spot the belts. You never send the belt to the cleaner because the leather on the other side would crack. So he had an ironing board with a glass top, and with benzene, he used to put it in his mouth and <laughs> blow like that, onto the, and then brush the belt clean. So he said, you want to learn how to do it? I said, sure, Dad. So he gave me, he said, you take a breath in and then blow it out. Well, I forgot to blow it out. <laughs> I never did that again. And the belts were cleaned by my father. I said, no more cleaning the belts. One day in the store on Atlantic Street, right across from the Palace Theater, 
I was must have been about four years old, and I, my mother wanted me in the store where she could keep an eye on me. So she gave me coloring book crayons, and it, I filled out the whole book. And now I'm bored, and I look in the window. You have nothing in a cleaning store except a mannequin and some signs. And there were windows that you had to climb over the uh, radiator, the little silver radiator, I remember. And so I got in the window. I was bored, so I jumped in the window, and somebody was watching me. So I picked up the sign, and I'm marching along, and I'm showing the sign. And I did it with the next sign. And also in the window was a headless mannequin with a fur coat. So I decided, now I've got a crowd around me. And the whole sidewalk was filled with people. So I started putting on a show. I danced, I sang, I did pantomime, and I got a hold of the sleeve of the mannequin. And I'm dancing as if it was my partner. And all of a sudden, I feel somebody grabbing my underwear. It was a policeman. The people across the street said there was a crowd blocking the sidewalk. And they, people were complaining, the stores were complaining that business was slowing down. <laughs> it was right after school, it was 2.30, and he called my mother from the back. She had no idea what I was doing. And the policeman said, you have to watch your daughter because look at the crowd. She, and they were all out there clapping at me, and I said, I'm going to be an actress someday. I loved it. <laughs> Let's talk about your family. Uh, where did you meet your husband? Well, oh God, <laughs> my husband and my older brother were good friends. He was going steady with my other sister's girlfriend. So I knew him through my brother and my sister. And uh, I was 12 years old the first time I ever saw him. He was 16, going steady with a nice girl. And uh, it was New Year's Eve. My brother had a party, and he was there. That's when I first saw him. Then years later, I, uh, I was dancing in Brigadoon the Stanford Community Theater. And he had just come out, came out of the Army, and his neighbor was Dorothy Polis Kalinske. And she used to go out with my brother in high school. So I knew her, and I knew the family. So after the play, it was the last night, it was, a, it was the, uh, they called that a cast party. Fine. So we went to the cast party, and he's sitting at another table next to Dottie Kalinsky. I'm over here with all the cast. And all of a sudden, I got hair sticking up on my neck. I said, something's wrong. I look up, and he's staring. Mr. Herbert Zieselman. I knew him as Zeke. I didn't know his first name. Make a long story short, he came over. Can I give you a ride home? I said, no, thank you. I didn't want to go with him because he was too old for me. And he said... That's right, I have to take Dottie Kalinsky home. Well, I know she lived next door to him. I said, oh, okay, I'll be safe. I, I didn't know him. I didn't, you know, he's been around, and I haven't. <laughs> so I decided no. Anyway, he said, okay, I'll take, take you home with Dottie. I thought he was going to take me home and then go home with Dottie. That son of a gun. He took her home first and then drove all the way across town to Blakesley Road, where we lived which house was taken by the throughway, and, uh, and he said, I'll call you. I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and make a long story short, he called me. Five days in a row, my mother answered and said, she was well, Zelda, Zeke Cecilman, I said, tell him I'm not home. Five days. Finally, the fifth day, she brings me the phone. She says, here, you tell him you're not home. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to tell him I'm not home. That would be stupid. So I said, yes, hello, I'm home. He, Can you go out? Yes, we went out. But I have to be home by 10 o'clock. He says, what do you mean? I said, my mother said, 10 o'clock. And in the meantime, my mother's going to sell the, such a nice boy from such a nice family. Please go out with him. So she's begging me, and I, I don't want to go out with him. Anyway, finally, he, we go out, and the whole time, <laughs> we, he talks about that's proper to kiss on the first date. And I said, no, it's not. I don't kiss on the first date. Sorry. He said, but it's okay. I said, no. Anyway, all the way, we went to see Paul Bloom. I don't know if you remember Paul, but he lived in Stanford. His, he was, his mother was Kuriansky, and uh, he moved to Nourishell. So we had to make a delivery, so I went with him for the ride. 
you know, after a play, there's such a letdown feeling. You know, so anyway, he takes me to the door, and I can't wait to get out of that car. I open the car, and the driveway's moving underneath me. I didn't want to be bothered. I knew I had to marry a Jewish boy. That I knew, because that's what my mother said and father. Anyway, he takes me to the door, and I, he says, can I kiss you goodnight? I said, I'll fix him. I'll give him such a kiss, he'll never call me again. So I pucker my lip, I boo. And oh, her, go her. <laughs> he gave me a kiss. I walk in the door. My mother's sleeping in the bed waiting for me. I come in and all of a sudden my my knees went buckled. My back slid down the the door, of the front door, inside the house. And I'm going, ah. my mother says, well, Zelda, what's the matter? I go, ah. Zelda, what's the matter? You all right? Ah. She says, I'm getting worried. What's wrong? I said, Ma, yeah, yeah, what? She's yelling at me. I think I'm in love. <laughs> and that was it. So when did you get married? 1954. We got married at Temple uh, Israel in White Plains because my mother was the first uh, president there of the sisterhood. So she wanted to get married there. We still have the old synagogue and Gray Rock Place, which didn't have a center aisle. And my mother wanted me to walk down the center aisle. I don't know why, but anyway, that's where we got married. And Rabbi Aaron Kranz, may he rest in peace, before he was married, he had just come to Stanford, and uh, he performed the ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we moved to Woodside Village right after that in a one-bedroom apartment. In fact, I grew up in Woodside Village when they first built it. We moved to 104. I was a young girl then, and from Crystal Street. They hadn't even finished building the other side of Woodside Village. Anyway, um, so we moved back to Woodside Village, and uh, that's where we lived um, until we bought our first house. What did Zeke do for a living? Zeke was an accountant. He, when he went to school, he went to uh, NYU graduated, and then he went in the Army in the 5th Finance Division, and then he came home, got married, and became certified, and I helped him study for his CPA exam. And he worked in Westchester for a company called Maury Singer & Company and eventually became a partner. And then we moved to Hazelwood Lane from Woodside Village uh, with a six-month-old baby. And we lived there 15 years, and from there, after our second daughter, we moved to, um, excuse me, I was just watching the door. We moved, <laughs> we moved to, um, that's, that's my bone squeaking. <laughs> we moved to a place called Blatchley Road. Uh, no, not Blatchley, I'm sorry. The Zamba Grove. Well, we were Zeke and Zelda Zieselin on the Zamba Grove, formerly of Hazelwood Lane. But I didn't know when we, he asked me to marry him, I said, I'll let you know. And then when we finally decided, I said, I'll put an announcement in the paper. I said, how do you spell Ezekiel? He says, what do you want to know for? I said, because that's your name. He says, no, it's not. I said, well, what does Zeke stand for? He says, that's my nickname. I'm marrying a man. I didn't even know his name. And I said, well, what is it? And he told me, Herbert Stanley Zeeson. What a beautiful name. I definitely will marry you now. How many children did you have? He had two. Have. Linda is one. My oldest daughter, she married a lovely boy she met at Iona College. They're both accountants. And uh, they live in Stanford. And they have two children. And they have two grandchildren, who are my great-grandchildren. And Judy married a local boy whose parents own Bedford Pharmacy. And their name is Stujenki. So she married, my daughter Judy married Paul Stujenki, who owned the Bedford Pharmacy. My daughter is a, um, my oldest daughter is an accountant. My youngest daughter is an interior architectural designer, presently working for class in Norwalk as their uh, kitchen designer. 
she's won a few awards and been written up. She did, did very nice. She's a very artistic chap. <laughs> she took my shoe boxes and she was two years old and made Pueblo <laughs> buildings out of it. And I said, this, this child's going to be a builder like her great grandpa. So uh, you have two daughters and two great grandchildren. I have two daughters, four granddaughters. Uh, one is married to a New York City policeman. Mm. They live in Carmel, New York, and they have two children, which makes me a great grandma. Yeah. Uh, so uh, did you have any work experience other than at Miller's Cleaners? Oh, yes. Um, when I was 16, I went to work for Dr. Noah Soloff. He was a dentist in Stanford. So I used to go to work after school and on Saturdays as a dental assistant to the assistant. And eventually I became a dental assistant. And then I, uh, from there, I took, I graduated high school and I went to work for a company called C.O. Miller's. I worked in their advertising and display department. We did the windows and we did the ads. And then when I was there, that's when I worked for the Stanford Community Theater and met Zeke again. And uh, from there, I worked for Dr. Mesh Weinstein, a dentist, on Bedford Street. Then I got pregnant, had Linda, and then later on when my youngest, I stayed home with my children until years later when my youngest was four, she went to nursery school with um, what's her name? Oh, from the Jewish Center. Um, Walker. Sarah, Sarah Walker. Sarah. Ah, thank you. She went to, And while she worked for Sarah Walker, I had a part-time job right next door to the old Jewish Center on Prospect Street uh, for a dentist, a pediodontist he was. And then um, I went on to work for Dr. Uh, um, Pearson. Well, actually, I started my own business years later called Dental Assistance Temporaries, and uh, I uh, took help dentists in emergencies because in none of the temporary agencies did they have dental assistance. So I started a business, and that was when I worked for many other dentists. And then I went to college to UConn, took courses, and created writing. I like to write. That is not so great in English, but I, I picked it up <laughs> and I started writing. And then I went to work in a furniture store. I was the assistant manager and then the manager. And uh, when my husband needed help in his office, he taught me bookkeeping. And I wanted to be an actress and a dancer. Oh, I worked at McLeany Dance Studio for a while teaching ballroom dancing. And then, uh, <laughs> so my husband taught me bookkeeping. So I became a bookkeeper. And then I was able to work for other people later on as a bookkeeper. And I took ABC shorthand so I could do shorthand. <laughs> I feel like the female George Plimpton. <laughs> and then I became a realtor. <laughs> and I was a realtor for Bigelow and Shafts later on. And uh, then Merrill Lynch, who became the Prudential. And that was fun because I, I was able to, I helped first time buyers, young couples who didn't know the first thing about buying and saving and down payments and the whole. So I specialized in first time buyers and I told them, when you're ready, call me, come back later on. And that's what I did. So with all these experiences and different types of employment, did you find any anti-Semitism? Oh boy, funny you should ask. When Lenore and I went to school at Franklin School, in the second grade, for some reason, in those days, they taught children in catechism um, that Jews killed Christ. I, I didn't know who he was because I'm Jewish. I came back from the holidays and everybody said, were you sick? I said, oh, no, it was the Jewish holidays. I go to, it was Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. They said, you're Jewish? I said, yeah, well, my sister and I got beaten up every day after school, on the way home from school. So she would walk frontwards and my back, and her back, hands were behind her, and I would hold her hands and walk back.
backwards. He would walk frontwards, I walk backwards, so we could see what's coming to get ready. Anyway, one day we came home, my father looked at us and said, what the heck happened to you? We were beaten up there. We were called all kinds of names, which I'm not going to repeat because you all know them already. And so my father said, look, Jewish people don't start a fight, but we'll finish it. I'm going to teach you girls how to box. And my father taught my sister and I how to box because he used to be on the boxing, you know, uh, in school. And my sister and I learned how to box. One day, <laughs> we're coming home from school again, hand behind each other, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and sure enough, through the alleyway and off of Broad, Broad, Bridge Street. Bridge, no. What's off Franklin Street? I think it's Bridge Street. Anyway, it was Broad Bridge and whatever. <coughs> there was an apartment house, and we would kind of hide through there, and we would get attacked. Well, my sister and I put up our dudes, and we gave it to them, and they never bothered us again. You have to, you have to defend yourself. You just can't take it anyway. So that was my, my um, experience with anti, with strong anti-Semitism. And of course, the ADL came in, and a lot of other wonderful organizations, and uh, and Israel came, and it was, it was easier a little bit. Sure, so depending. Now in your senior years, uh, did you spend any time in Florida? Did, I did. Just I, winters, or were you there? Well, originally, we bought time-sharing in Florida, in Delray, and we'd go there once a week, my husband and I, just before tax season. In the winter season? Uh, pardon me? In the winter season, yeah. At the, <laughs> it was uh, just for one week. No, it wasn't even the season, because it was still tax season. So we went for one week before tax before tax season, and then we had time sharing at Shawnee, Pennsylvania. So after tax season, we'd go there to unwind and rest, and we played golf and the mayflies and the face. And it was fun though. And that, then eventually, um, my husband and I always Herb wanted to always retire in Florida. So I said, okay, someday we'll live in Florida. Well. He passed away in 1992 at 62 years old, wow. and uh, I was 58, and so I stayed home, and then I went for the timeshare, and it wasn't the same, of course, but I went anyway, and then I realized we were going to settle in Florida, so after he passed away, I spent my winters in Florida in a rental, and after six years, I ended up buying a, a nice little place in a place called Aberdeen in uh, Boynton Beach. And I had a wonderful time, met friends, got active, wrote plays, we put on shows, we did all kinds of fun things. And then when I, I fell, it was time for me to not to live alone anymore, so I moved to a place called Aberdeen, not Aberdeen, I lived in Aberdeen, Atria, in uh, Lantiana, I love to say Lantiana, Florida. It was an atrium meridian, and I spent six years there, and I got the flu, and then my kids said, come on, Mom, you're coming home to this cold winter weather which I tried to escape from. So I moved back, and here I am, and I got already involved in organizations here. I'm on the dining room committee, which is meeting now next door, which I'm not going to be at. They'll manage without me. I gave them my notes. And... Um, I'm a vice president of the resident council. I'm also an ambassador. We started the ambassadors again, meaning when new residents come in, um, we welcome them and show them around. Well, yes. I know that uh, you've written some poetry that you'd like to share with us. I would and, love to. That's my then, hobby. Hey, why don't you open your book of poetry? And Well, when I lived in Florida, I wrote my first... Oh, after my husband passed away, I, I forgot to even mention it. I took six years of poetry lessons with a wonderful poetry teacher. And through him, I was able to publish my first book of poetry. Hold it there. It's called Laughter, Love, and Lunacy. 
and it was published in 2002. Mm. And one of the poems I wrote was called Shabbat Time, if I may. At the Shabbat table in white mantles, at sundown women pray with joy, bow their heads over white candles, reciting Baruch Atah Adonai. Donned and round yarmulkes on their heads, men say the mozi before they share pieces of golden baked challah bread, a mozi lechem in a horus prayer. Bore pre sweet wine is tasted. A guffin drink the fruit of the vine. All take a sip, not a drop is wasted. Cups raise, say lachayim, at Shabbat time. Oh, Shabbat, a peaceful day we have fun, which starts Friday nights with the setting sun and ends Saturday with three stars above. Shabbat joys are song, songs, prayers, and family love. And that's in the book. And then recently, with a little bit of humor, my friends keep saying, Zelda, why do you keep saying oy vey, oy vey? I said, because I feel like it. My mother always said oy vey. And I picked it up, and this is the poem I, I wrote. It's called, <clears throat> but forgive me, my grandfather was a cantor, and when he would sing on holidays, I would come home and imitate him. So I started, <laughs> I'm not going to sing the whole song, I promise you. Oy vey, oy vey, oy vey, mine pets, they run away, mine horse won't eat his hay, oy vey. I owned a horse who neighed all night. Squirrel scampered by, horse gave a bite. Squirrel limped and scampered like a clutch. In pain, squall dropped, squirrel dropped his winter's nuts. Oy vey, oy vey, oy vey. I sold mine horse in hay, oy vey. My neighbor was a bissel drunk, shared kosher wine to his pet skunk. They swam in mine clean pool to dunk. From sopping drunks, mine backyard stunk. Oy vey, oy vey, oy vey, croquet no more can play, oy vey. From shelter saved a mangy mutt, her coat I preen, long nails I cut. His head would rest upon my chest, mutt, <laughs> mutt bullied skunk only in jest, oy vey, oy vey, oy vey, drunk skunk. Belched out a spray. Oy vey. I taught my mother arithmetic, some Yiddish sticks and circus tricks. My dog had earned a decent pay, <laughs> and hooray, wealth now is on its way. My doggie's name now etched a stone. I cried and cried again alone. I found stray cat, was old and fat. He scampered, he scratched my hat. I called out, scat. When cat heard scat, he ran away, oy vey, oy vey, oy vey. Again, mine cat's astray. Stone clouds hung gray down alley vey, where bought a blue jay made from clay. On swing he swung and sung and swayed. Mine blue jay trilled, I'm here to stay. So thrilled no longer, say oy vey. Right, we have some uh, family pictures that uh, you might want to share with uh, your family when we put it on the video. Oh, well, the so. first one I'm happy to show. This is, I don't know if you want to take a close-up. Is this good? Mm hmm Okay. This is my grandmother and my great-uncle Davis. That's Dave Sherlock and Jane Sherlock Miller, your brother and sister. At, I think that day's uh, birthday, was it? No, it was their 50th wedding anniversary. Dave and Esther's 50th wedding anniversary. Yeah. What a wonderful day. And that was my grandfather and her grandmother. 
my cousin Lester Charlotte, that's his grandfather, and my grandmother, our, our brother and sister. So we're related for real. I would like those two little ones, please. <laughs> this is a house uh, used to be at 1215 Summer Street. My grandma and grandpa Grapsky owned it. It was a two-family house. It's no longer there. What do we have here, Zelda? This is when I was in a show. I did a lot of theater work with Stanford Community Theater. And we did Brigadoon, and I met this actor. And he looked so much like Jackie Gleason. We did a takeoff, and uh, I was his uh, one of the pinup girls, I guess, at the time. And he did a fabulous Jackie Gleason. And that was at the Stanford uh, Community Theater. I think the show was on Stanford High School. Mm -hmm. It probably says it if you can read it. <laughs> it's Stanford at Sunday Herald. This is the Sunday Herald, uh, November 14, 1954. This must have been the Bridgeport paper, I guess. I don't remember. That was my wedding announcement. Where did you get married? At White Plains at Temple. Sinai, uh, Sinai, November 14, 1954. <laughs> 54. That's Herbert Stanley Zieselman, who is also related to the Weisbergs and the Spelkies in Stanford. His grandfather and my grandfather used to be friends, and then they had a fight and sued each other. I don't know if I told you that story, but his grandfather was Jacob Weisberg, and he was past president of Aguda Shalom. My grandfather was Harry w Grabsky, and he was a cantor in Poland. And when he came here, he would daven on the holidays as a cantor mm -hmm. because they couldn't get one in. And um, I think we have Rabbi Lem with Sholsom. That's my oldest daughter, and she married um, Alan Edwards from Nourishell, New York. And what was her first name? Linda, Linda Ellen. Uh, Zieselman married Alan Edwards. And now I have another picture of my daughter who married also local, because Zeke and I were born, Zeke was his nickname, and uh, we were both born in Stanford. And he was born in Nourishell. That's Linda. She's now a grandmother. And I have a picture of my other daughter. Should I just slide it over? Or yeah. Just, how's this? That's Judy. I don't know if you got the good angle on it. <laughs> I'll see if I can open it up a little no, more. No, it's fine. It is? Okay. She married Paul Stujenki. Paul Stujenki's parents, uh, Lee and Jack, owned Bedford Pharmacy on Bedford Street on the corner of Bedford and what's the name of that street? Ready? Yeah. Okay. This is a picture of my mother's graduating class in Stanford in 1921 at the old original Stanford High School, which then became Burdick Junior High. My mother is, we want to zoom in, right there. That's Celia Gratsky, before she married Seymour Miller, 1921. And I gave a, a copy of this picture. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lean it on this picture so I don't have to hold it and make it easier for you. Wait, how about if I did it this way? Okay, this was done uh, at a good Sholom synagogue. My mother, first of all, it was called the Kosher Cabaret, and we put on the show to raise money for the Hebrew school. I'm on the very end. Next to me is Eddie Pompadour. And then you go on, and here's Celia Grabsky Miller doing Sophie Tucker. And uh, we raised over $500. But this is my great grandmother, and her name was Zelda. And that's who I was named after. And her last name was Landfish. So it was Zelda Landfish. I was named after her. I have another picture I'm going to slide right in front in exchange. And this picture I'm going to show you now is Edith Grapsky. She is the daughter 
of the woman I just showed you in the long dress, Mrs. Landfish. She married Harry Gravsky, and this is her standing in front of her grocery store on Pacific Street many, many years ago. This is another picture of her as a single girl, and this picture was taken in a studio in New York City. And I was, I was told that this picture I'm sliding in now is a family cousins club taken in Stamford, Connecticut at 1215 Summer Street at my grandmother's house in Stamford, Connecticut. I can't make out anybody except my grandfather because the picture is so blurred. I have a cousin who was born in Stanford. His name was Eric Chandler, and he was kind enough to make copies of these pictures. Uh, to continue, I'd like to mention uh, on my um, husband's side, his grandfather, um, Jacob Weisberg, was one of the co-founders of uh, the Good Shalom Synagogue, and he was also one of the presidents. And my father, grandfather, Harry White Grafsky, was friends with Mr. Judge Weisberg and uh, Mr. Weisberg. And, uh, and they, one was a builder of Hen on Henry Street, and my grandfather, of course, was a coppersmith and delivered his pipes. The thing that I'd like to mention is how the whole families are related between my husband's family and my family, because I have cousins because my husband and I have share the same cousins. And who are they? Ben Weisberg married uh, uh, Marion Sharlock. Marion Sharlock is my cousin, second or third cousin from England, the whole family from England. And so what happened was when my husband and I got married, his uncle Ben Weisberg and my cousin <laughs> Marion Sharlock, who were already married, their children became cousins from both of us. We were each cousins before. The children were so related, our children, with the Sharlock, Weisberg, Spelke family, Miller family, and it was like a wonderful little town. And uh, Max Myers, of course, was relative Sharlock's furniture. And it was a wonderful little town, Stanford, where we all used to get together at family gatherings. And I will be happy to show you some of my artwork that's on display now. Yeah, before we do that, yes, sir. I want to mention that uh, my entire working career was at Rovins. And when I first came to work there, we were moving uh, on Atlantic Street, where Tresser Boulevard now exists. And uh, Jacob Weisberg was the carpenter that came in to redo the showcases right. and uh, he was the expert uh, cabinet maker yes. that redid all the furniture so it fit into the new store. Wow. So I remember him very well. He was a wonderful builder and a good builder. He built houses on Hubbard Avenue also. Mm -hmm. While he was building a house on Hubbard Avenue, my grandma Gratsky and grandfather owned this house on Summer Street, 1215. My mother and my husband's mother were both teenagers, so they had no place to live. So my grandfather and grandma invited the Weisbergs to live with them in their house, which was a rooming house, until their house was finished on Hubbard Avenue. Well, that's interesting. So they go, my mother and my husband's mother knew each other as teenage girls. Mm -hmm. This is a pen and ink I did of a picture I saw in a magazine and it caught my eye. It was very moving and I just did a pen and ink of a rabbi. It looks like he's praying at the Wailing Wall. This picture you're looking at now is of an old lady. The reason I did her because I found her intriguing because of the way she sat, her long fingers and the lines on her face and I thought she was very expressionless, and I just enjoyed doing her. I was very impressed with her, with her scarf and the way she was dressed. And it's also a pen and ink. Hi. Uh, this is a pastel I did when I took art lessons. 
my teacher liked the picture and she asked me if I would like to do it and I said sure and I drew it and then I did it in pastel um, she said she liked it so much because of the expression she was a wonderful teacher and so she told me to have it framed and I did and here it hangs now at Atria in the mezzanine floor that's Atria Stanford uh, this is another pastel I did of a young girl after I took a few lessons I decided I'm going to try it on my own and I found this one I asked my teacher what she thought she said go for it and I did it's another pastel I love working in pastel and also had it framed and it's still hanging now in the mezzanine at Atria in Stanford okay I'm happy to show you this uh, it's a watercolor and it's a muted uh, picture of street in Paris um, during a rainy day and I, this is a watercolor that I did with a teacher in Stanford who was a watercolorist anyway it's uh, also framed hanging in the same mezzanine in Stanford one of my many paintings I did about 30 40 paintings and this is one of them that's good oh, come on this is a, an acrylic that I did uh, a few years ago in um, Florida when I stayed at an atria there called Atria Meridian. We had a wonderful art teacher and every week we'd go in and do acrylic painting. And this is one of my paintings that I did in Florida of a fishing pier. And I kind of liked the coloring and uh, enjoyed the, the teacher and the artwork. First time I've used acrylics, very different from oil painting. And that's my painting, and I have um, uh, quite a few down in my apartment which aren't hung yet. I just want to say, in f my final um, comments, is how wonderful it was to see Lester again, Lester Charlotte, who was doing the video today. Also, it was a pleasure to be asked to do this for the historical Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield. So um, I wish you all well and uh, continued success. And I was very happy and proud to be part of this historical moment and time in Stamford, Connecticut. Thank you, Zelda. It's been a pleasure with it, doing this interview. It's one of the best. Well, thank you, Lester.